Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Architecture for Health weekly visiting lecture series. We have an outstanding uh, uh, principles of uh, Ballinger Architects in Philadelphia. And Lou Milik is, uh, and Aaron Cooper are gonna be introduced by uh, Dr. Jay Maddock. He's the former Dean and Professor of Public Health at the School of Public Health at Texas A&M University. My name is George Mann. If you have any questions, I always like to stay afterwards. If you're practicing architects you're, uh, and you don't have the form, I can uh, provide the form if you send me an email. That's manngj885 at gmail.com. So now I'd like to turn the program over and uh, I, also want to recognize the Associate Director of the Center for Health Systems and Design, Zipang Lu. And uh, anything else you want to add, Zipang? Uh, no, uh, thank you, George. Okay, so uh, Jay Maddock has been very active on campus and in the public health area. He uh, uh, is an active member of the faculty of the School of Public Health and a fellow of the Center for Health Systems and Design. So it's your turn, Jay. So uh, let's turn it over to you for the introduction. All right, thank you very much, George. Uh, we are delighted to have two outstanding speakers today. I am super excited. I've seen some of their slides and I can't wait to hear uh, what they've got to tell us. So without further ado, we have uh, Louis uh, Mayling. He's a senior uh, principal at Bollinger. Uh, he developed a national practice focusing on programming, planning, and design for all facilities. For the last 25 years, his design solutions have helped shape the future of healthcare at academic medical centers, regional and community hospitals, and healthcare delivery systems. He worked closely with clients to develop facility solutions and translate highly complex projects into simple terms. His orientation towards client service and delivery of high quality, cost-effective projects have brought him recognition from both healthcare institutions as well as his peers. We also have Erin Nunez Cooper. She's the Director of Project Management and a Principal at Bollinger, specializing in healthcare planning and design. She brings high aspirations for quality of the built environment and the patient, family, and team care experience. She has managed complex healthcare projects, including New York's Presbyterian Ambulatory Care Center, which is one of the largest healthcare projects in the country. Erin developed the formal process for guiding project stakeholders through decision making using role-playing workshops with 3D printed model pieces. Today, they're gonna to be talking about state-of-the-art healing environments, heart and cancer care. Take it away, guys. Well, Dr. Maddox, thank you for that uh, kind introduction and howdy. Howdy. Uh, Aaron and I are delighted to be back with you today since we spoke a couple of years ago in the PBS studio and to see all of you virtual and to uh, share some of our experiences with heart and cancer centers. So uh, our agenda today, will tell you just a little bit about who Ballinger is. Uh, we'll set the stage with some of the design drivers and some facts on chronic disease. And then we'll dive into some case studies on heart care and cancer care and finish up with uh, some questions and answers. So uh, Ballinger, uh, founded in 1878, is the oldest actively a &E practice in the United States. Uh, we're in a single office in Philadelphia, uh, 270 professionals strong. And we really practice at the intersection of award-winning design and our thought leadership and experience. And it's really at this intersection that our culture of innovation and our hallmark of innovation thrives. Uh, we just practice across multiple marketplaces that you see here. But we, I think as most of you know, we have a specific focus or concentration in health and academic. Uh, we have the privilege of working with some of the most prestigious academic, regional, and community hospitals in the country, often at very pivotal times in their growth. So today we're gonna feature four projects. Uh, the Penn Medicine Chester County will be a heart care project. And then we're gonna feature three cancer centers. If our talk had a subtitle, it would be cancer centers from New York City to the Great Plains. So you're gonna see three very different cancer centers uh, within our talks here. 
So I want to set the stage with some design considerations that you'll see in all of our projects that all of us probably know well, but they're worth stating. Uh, we want to build to promote wellness. We want to humanize the patient experience and really put patients first. And that includes connections to nature and biophilia, like you see in the image to the right, they're going to see as a central theme in many of our projects. We want to think of the family member as a care team, part of that care team, and really provide space in the clinical environment for them to be and participate. We want to think of that multidisciplinary collaboration between caregivers as well as support space for them. Because we all know that caregivers that feel cared for and have adequate space give more holistic and compassionate care. And of course, maybe never more than our current moment during the pandemic, uh, safety and satisfaction as always are very critical. So these are some of the design considerations to be thinking about as we go through today. So chronic disease. A uh, significant in issue in the United States, a significant issue in the world that we're all aware of. Nearly one half of Americans suffer from one chronic disease. And in fact, in adults, that 60% have at least one or 40% that have two or more chronic diseases. And you can see that two thirds of all deaths are caused uh, by one or more of these five chronic diseases that you see listed here, of which today we'll talk about heart and cancer which are the top two by far, uh, unfortunately, in deaths every year. And this accounts for about 75% of our spending on healthcare in the United States, chronic disease. So very significant how we manage that, how we think about that, how do we get upstream with that going forward to promote more wellness. And you can see while there are many risk factors shown below, uh, the four risk factors that are the, the, the most key in chronic disease are not unfamiliar with tobacco use and secondhand smoke, poor nutrition, lack of physical activity, and excessive alcohol use. So these are key contributors to chronic disease. So kind of having set the stage with that, let's start with the, uh, the number one chronic disease, which is heart care. And we're gonna walk through one example of a heart center. So at Penn Medicine, Chester County, uh, the new surgical platform and inpatient bed tower opened in August of 2020 that you're gonna see here today. So opening during the pandemic was quite a challenge. And so you'll see that we'll have a range of renderings and some photos that the hospital provided to us because we were not able to professionally photograph the project at this time. Uh, but as in many heart centers, this is a heart center of excellence within the hospital. A little historical fact that you might like, Pierre DuPont, American entrepreneur, well known for uh, starting DuPont Chemical Company, amongst many of his talents, uh, was the original donor for this hospital campus. Uh, he had lost an employee, uh, Lewis Mason, uh, a friend and employee, and uh, was treated at the original Chester County Hospital, and his generosity gave the land and money to build the new hospital in 1926, but his one caveat was that it followed the Italian Renaissance style, given his visit to the Pitti Palace in Florence. And you'll see 100 years later, uh, we're still continuing uh, that aesthetic on the campus. So uh, this is an aerial of the campus. You see the concentration of buildings uh, with the terracotta roofs uh, to the left side uh, in a largely suburban area. And you can see the construction photo of the parking garage here that was under construction. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see this 36 acre campus and a master plan, the Lasco Tower there in the darker color was the first pavilion built. And then the second pavilion that's just opened last year includes the second patient tower, the procedural platform, complete new main entrance and emergency expansion uh, that you see there at part of phase two and a new arrival. So the aerial here you see is kind of looking down on that new arrival and you see the patient pavilion to the right. You see the two-story entry pavilion and classic in this uh, kind of Mediterranean style is the series of pavilions and courtyards that we continued, even though this building is a larger scale than many of existing. And you could see the landform and landscaping at the entry, as well as the significant green roof to the right, again, bringing uh, biophilia and nature, even in a more dense setting here. And here you see kind of a section through that entry pavilion 
and you see the pavilions and the courtyards with the glass connector between the buildings. And I'll use the slide just to note that it's a 250,000 square foot expansion and renovation with that new front door, a new 18 room operating and interventional platform and 100 new beds, as well as a rooftop helipad for the level two trauma center. So here's programmatically uh, what that means. And I think it's just worth noting, especially for the students, when you think of heart care, some of those main components, uh, pre-emission testing and non-invasive testing for stress tests, echo tests, non-invasive testing. Uh, you see the procedural platform that would have all of the open heart ORs, the cardiac catheterization rooms, cardiovascular hybrid. Uh, you see the emergency department, and then you see the inpatient beds for ICU, step down, and medical surgical. So all components that are key to a comprehensive heart center. So here I'm gonna do just a brief walkthrough. So if we come in, you see the plans to the right, you'll come in the new two-story pavilion and to the entrance and the concierge that you see there in the picture. And immediately you'll have that view that leads you out to the courtyard just up the page. And up to the right is where the pre-emission testing and the non-invasive cardiology is that starts your heart care right here on the first floor. And there are various other amenities of cafe, gift shops and things here at this first level. And then here you're getting that view from the courtyard. The ginkgo trees have not crying grown, grown in yet here, uh, but you see that view back uh, to that lobby that we entered. And uh, this, there's a grand stair as well as elevators that lead you up to the procedural platform. Uh, here is the ED expansion, and you can see all private rooms that are like mini ICUs that are all standardized uh, with the head wall and use of wood for warmth. Uh, here's the, actually the second floor plan moving up to the, uh, the operating room floor. Uh, if you come off the elevators there to the bottom left, I'll show you a picture in a minute that looks out to that same courtyard and you'll come in and check in and you'll travel along the light filled corridor to the bottom and into one of the private prep and recovery room neighborhoods. And then from there, you'll come into the procedure. And here, this is a procedure platform with surgical and interventional all in one platform, which could quite a bit of work uh, to get everyone to want to play in one area. Uh, but specifically to the right is, is, is a six pack of operating room that have the cardiac catheterization rooms, the electrophysiology, the open heart and the vascular rooms, all are in that six pack for heart care. So now we'll do a quick pictorial. So if you come off the elevators, this is the view that looks out to that courtyard. And there is also a terrace here at this level in good weather that you can go out as you're waiting for surgery. Uh, as you come in, this is the path along the light filled corridor that leads you to your prep recovery neighborhood. And then you'll come into the private prep recovery uh, neighborhoods. You see decentralized stations between each of the two prep recovery rooms. So decentralized stations are not just for patient rooms. They're also, uh, you see here in prep recovery, and you'll have direct view into uh, the private prep recovery rooms that you see uh, here on the next slide with room for the family to be participate uh, in the experience. So then from here, you would come in. This is one of the corridors that leads you to the cardiac catheterization and the electrophysiology labs. And then we'll show you here a picture. This is a picture of the cath lab itself uh, with the GE Innova. And then on the next slide, you'll see this is the Pheno robot. So this is a hybrid room. So this can do open heart as well as array of cardiovascular procedures here in the platform. And as we move up to the patient floors, this is a templated floor. Uh, this is ICU, but there are three medical floors above. So you could see that you could come from surgery right off the patient transport elevators, and you could come right into the ICU, very close, uh, 24 ICU beds on the floor. And the whole building is templated, so they all meet ICU standards for future flexibility. And uh, you can see here, this is a view at a typical medical surgical bed. And it's interesting to think of the views from the bedrooms. This is an interesting aerial, and you can see that the landscape's growing in, but the procedural platform roof to the right has a landform green roof. 
that's very dramatic when you look across from all the patient rooms. So instead of looking across the regular membrane roof, there are some distance views, but you're also seeing this landform green roof there. And you're also seeing at the main entry, the landforms are still growing in as this opened in August and some of the landscaping did not go into the fall. It's interesting that you see the terracotta roofs, you see the helipad, and you see the people on the roof. So you get a sense of scale and you see how small the people are in the helipad, which is a key element uh, for trauma and for heart care. So um, excited about the project at Chester County. They opened again under the pandemic. And as you'll see, kind of a night view on the next slide. Uh, we're hoping to do a post-occupancy evaluation uh, moving forward, as well as taking some professional photographs. So um, our first case study here on heart care. Erin? Thank you, Lou. Uh, I'll jump right in and we'll go through a series of case studies uh, on three cancer center projects. And we're going to show them in chronological order. And what's interesting about them is throughout these three case studies, we are going to hit all aspects of the process from pre-design through construction and post-occupancy evaluations. And each one of the three is very different and unique. There's not kind of a one size fits all to a cancer center. And as Lou mentioned earlier, you know, the subtitle of our talk could be from New York City to the Great Plains. Uh, we really have a wide variety of kind of uh, sites and locations. And before I jump into the first one, um, our kind of timeline and chronology is that our first project uh, started in 2009 and was really a five year duration from start to finish. Uh, and the second project that we show began in 2011, went about seven years. And then our last one, we began design in 2019 and are still in the design process. So it will be interesting as we walk through them, we can look for things uh, from one project to the other that have kind of continued to evolve and how one has informed our kind of subsequent work. So our first uh, project profile here is Penn Medicine, Lancaster General Health, uh, the Ann Barshinger Cancer Institute. And this might be familiar to some of you. It opened in 2014, uh, was part of Ballinger's talk here a few years ago. But what we're going to talk about today is just a brief kind of overview of the project, but also share some highlights from one of our post-occupancy evaluations that we did. So jumping right in, our overall kind of vision was really having a very contextual building, really well integrated into the site and really creating a place of healing. This is one of the early uh, watercolor uh, renderings that we have of the building. And the site was quite interesting. There is a grade change and we were able to really make use of that and really work it to our advantage. Uh, cancer centers have a wide variety or kind of co-location of programs. And we were able to use some vertical circulation to split uh, programs that wanted to be in different areas, but have them kind of neatly packed in a, in a tight geography, um, but have expansive views both to an inner courtyard, which you see here, uh, as well as out to the site. Looking at the overall distribution of the program, uh, many common elements in cancer care uh, centers would, of course, inc include arrival, uh, an administration space, but really a co-location of patient care center uh, here is really a multidisciplinary clinic with exam rooms, uh, an area for infusion, and an area for radiation therapy. Uh, this particular project has some really well thought out common spaces, public spaces, and amenities for patients, families, and staff. So part of the early process of, of this and all of our cancer center process, projects includes flow mapping. And in this example, we were really looking at what was the prior process for an infusion patient and kind of mapping out steps for how we would envision a new process to optimize many things. And as part of that process, we identified two key enablers for lab turnaround times and pharmacy. And we share this because this really sheds a new light on program and adjacency when we kind of bring in that kind of fourth dimension of time. So just walking through the floor plans at the lower level, there's a multidisciplinary clinic. It is organized in neighborhoods. Uh, patients and families arrive here and they circulate along a light-filled corridor and they can enter this multidisciplinary clinic through one of several portals. And we have a, a natural progression from kind of more public areas here uh, to more private areas at the kind of uh, wider radius. 
And then on the upper level, this is where we have our infusion therapy uh, arranged along the edge of the radius. And in the green kind of square areas here, we have radiation oncology. And here we see the, the placement of that interior garden, uh, bringing in biophilia to the space. So from that watercolor rendering, the, that vision of having kind of a healing bridge to cross over and kind of start a patient's healing journey, we see here in the arrival process, getting to the site. And when arriving by car, once you cross that bridge, you have a wonderful view of the building. It's very transparent and you can see in uh, and a beautiful reflecting pool in front. So we brought some of that biophilia into the building and used it as part of a wayfinding strategy with a green wall right behind the, uh, the primary reception desk. And as you kind of turn that corner, uh, that's where we took advantage of the grade change and we have a light filled circulation path marking the entrances of the portals in the blue glass that you see here. And this is a view into that internal courtyard. And over time, it's just the, the greenery is very lush. It's a wonderful, wonderful space uh, visible from uh, numerous locations throughout the facility. So we completed a post-occupancy evaluation, which was really informative uh, after the building was, was opened, had been occupied for some time, and found it really helpful to actually split feedback from staff, which are shown in blue, in all of these bar graphs, and patients, which are shown in green. Uh, so I'll just hit a few highlights here. Uh, after the, the post-occupancy evaluation, 66% uh, of staff were satisfied with views to nature and 100% of patients. And what's interesting about that is that there really was a move and an initiative to prioritize views to nature for, for patients. Uh, we also provided it for staff as well. 100% um, of staff and patients were, uh, were pleased with access to daylight. Uh, in that multidisciplinary clinic and throughout the space, we have uh, numerous consultation rooms really intended for collaboration where caregivers can collaborate with one another. And 100% of the staff found that those uh, felt the consultation rooms were really beneficial. And 97% of, of patients felt that the spaces were really there and available to coordinate patient care with personnel. Uh, so looking a little bit at uh, the attention that we gave to circulation and split flows, uh, it was great to see in the post-occupancy evaluation that 95% of patients were really satisfied with that split flow uh, and 88% of staff as well. We also really wanted to investigate visit time and were uh, really intrigued by some of the responses that 58% of the time was spent receiving treatment uh, and the rest of the time was split uh, meeting with healthcare providers, but also spent in some of the amenity spaces throughout the building, including the meditation room, viewing some of the artwork, the healing garden and the image recovery center. Uh, so here again, uh, very positive responses and you can see the meditation room with a view out into the garden. Uh, many of the patients were really pleased and, and felt that the amenities improved the patient experience. And we love this, qu this quote by Dr. Oyer uh, at the completion of the project. He said, the interior garden, the landscaping and siting of the building to allow just the right light, create the connection between the indoors and the outdoors and desired appreciation of nature. So moving on to our next case study, our, our, our project profile of the David H. Koch Center at New York Presbyterian. Uh, this is a LEED Gold certified uh, project in New York and was a collaboration among HOK, Ballinger, and Paycov Reed. Uh, some of you as well might be familiar with this project from our prior talks on the Big Five. And while we've talked about the overall building as a whole, today we're going to focus on the cancer center components of it. Uh, in contrast to the project we saw at Lancaster, this is uh, an incredibly dense urban site uh, in New York. It's on 68th and York Avenue. Um, but really interesting is that um, we can see the building here uh, in the photo at the left and up in the uh, mid registers of the building, we actually have views to the East River. 
So the overall stack of the building uh, is a large 740,000 square foot facility of 18 floors, includes not just cancer care, uh, but also a, a pretty robust outpatient care facility and a hospital for women and newborns. Uh, the first phase opened in 2018, and the second phase opened as well during the pandemic in August of 2020. So today we're going to highlight and focus the cancer and surgery areas of the David H. Koch Center. Uh, some cancer facilities might be standalone. Uh, others like this one might have cancer care embedded within a larger facility. On this project, we approached the flow mapping in a slightly different way. I think we learned quite a bit from our, our work at Lancaster and really looking at the patient and family experience. And we, we went about it here by trying to choreograph, choreograph and craft what the ideal kind of future patient family experience would be from the time that they pre-register and arrive at the building all the way through their journey uh, through treatment and till they depart. That was a really fascinating study that really informed the way that we designed the building. Uh, the surgery area uh, where many of the, the cancer patients do have surgery in the building, um, as well as other surgical subspecialties. It's organized in a template throughout the building. We have 12 operating rooms here uh, in, around a clean core and 36 prep and recovery rooms. Uh, we used a similar portal concept where the public and patients arrive on the elevators here. They travel along natural light and they can come in through a series of portals to their dedicated private prep recovery room. Uh, on the fourth floor, this is really our cancer focused floor. Uh, the public and, and patients arrive on the same elevators, the same arrival experience, but we were very careful to craft the organization of the floor uh, to really focus on the, on the patient flows. So patients arriving for infusion who need a blood draw that day, that is their first stop. Uh, they come in for blood draw. Um, if they are receiving infusion, uh, they can go directly down to the infusion area in green. Uh, if they are seeing their, their doctor for a visit, they can come to an exam room. We have a split flow for patients who are coming to uh, radiation therapy. They come up along the north, again, traveling along that light-filled corridor, and the progression of their journey throughout the space is pretty, uh, you know, through that portal concept again. Uh, so we have a pack of exam rooms, and we'll see in some of the photos, these are double-sided exam rooms, so uh, patients enter through the perimeter corridor, and there's an additional door to a staff collaboration space. Uh, we have three radiation therapy uh, rooms here with linear accelerators and New York City's first uh, MR-guided linear accelerator. And here we see those arranged uh, on the floor. And worth noting that these are on the fourth floor, which is pretty unique. Um, it's, it's no small feat to put these uh, up elevated in the air uh, with all of the shielding uh, and lead lining required in these rooms. And so I will walk us through a little bit of the construction process and construction photos that show how we achieved them. Um, so in order to get the, that kind of thickness and that, uh, and that lead lining below, uh, we do have some depressions in the slab across that kind of back area of, of the floor plan. They are lined with lead bricks, uh, which required quite a bit of coordination with our structural engineer, uh, not just for the end result, but also during construction and working with our construction manager to stage them in a way that uh, could be loaded on the floor. And of course, safety aspects with working with lead as those are lined. And here we start to see some of the rebar and the formwork for this interesting shape, which is a pit that holds the MR guided linear accelerator, also lined with lead. Uh, when we combined uh, MRI technology with the linear accelerator, we also have our, our copper shielding here. And then we start to see the room coming together with finishes. And there's pretty extensive uh, work to have the gantry, the MRI, and the linear accelerator delivered, located, sited, and calibrated. And then our end result and what the patient sees is a pretty simple um, clean room. Uh, we brought in wood and natural materials to have kind of a calming experience for them when they're in here. 
Um, so really interesting to see what happens behind the scenes as these uh, real high technology pieces come together. I'll walk you through a day in the life of a patient. Uh, they arrive in a through drive. Uh, there was a very interesting art program throughout the building that had a global theme. Uh, this is a tile work uh, by an artist, Beatrice Milhazes from Brazil. And she also has uh, a piece in the main lobby. And it was really interesting being in a, a, a dense urban site, trying to bring, bring aspects of nature and biophilia, even if we couldn't be in kind of that, that green wooded area like we might see in other sites, bringing in elements of that through wood, natural materials, and artwork. Uh, there's kiosk check-in in the lobby. And patients receive an itinerary for their day so they know where they are going throughout the building. Uh, lots of embedding technology throughout their journey. Uh, patients and their families are banded and that allows them access to the elevators. They arrive in light-filled corridors, uh, have private prep recovery rooms. And here is the view walking towards uh, surgery uh, into an operating room, again on the light-filled corridor, which is a pretty unique opportunity. Uh, here we have an operating room. And I'll pause here and note that in this facility, we did use removable wall panels. And then after surgery, patients return to their dedicated private prep recovery room, uh, similar to what Lou mentioned in, uh, in our, our, heart, our heart center, uh, we have decentralized stations outside of pairs of prep recovery rooms. And then walking down towards some of the other patient care areas, particularly in a cancer center, we wanna be mindful of uh, patients and family members. They can, they can have fatigue. So having stopping points along the way and integrating those with artwork. Here we see an infusion bay. Uh, there's a blend of private and public rooms in the space, uh, balancing visibility from the care team station to uh, the treatment area. And here we see more of a communal area. Some infusion patients might prefer to be uh, with friends and colleagues who are also undergoing similar treatment, uh, while we have more private rooms and choice for patients depending on how they're feeling. And here we see one of the double-sided exam rooms. We're looking at it from the patient entry side, and this door here leads to the staff collaboration space. And as we leave the facility, again, walking through uh, light-filled corridors through the sky lobby and leaving the building. So I will turn it over to Lou to cover the Bryan Cancer Center. So we'll go from the Upper East Side in New York City to here to Lincoln, Nebraska. So a little bit different environment than we just walked through uh, to say. And uh, this new cancer center here is on 30 acres in South Lincoln, which is a growing area. And in 2019, when I visited the site, this was my first view. These are British white cows with the distinctive dark ears. Pretty cool. They looked a little imposing. I didn't go beyond the fence. Um, and we have quite a hilly site here. So here you're seeing this 30 acres of land that was donated. I'll show you that video in just a moment. And um, this is south of Lincoln, but you start to see some of the developing residential and other things in an up and coming area. The freeways are developing. And uh, you'll see on the next slide, um, kind of we reorientated now north is to the left on this plan. So it fits. You can see this 30 acres, the cancer center is in the deeper yellow. And then there are two future buildings, which could be MOB, ASC, uh, or other things to be considered. And the cancer center was orientated around this pond, this natural feature on the site. And, you know, I grew up in St. Louis and went to school in Kansas, even though I'm in Philly. And, you know, you think of the, the plains as being fairly flat. From the bottom right of our site to the bottom left, we have a 50-foot grade change. So that's pretty significant, even across a 30-acre site. But you'll see in a little bit of how we use that grade change to our advantage and how we sited the building and how we dealt with the building height and access to nature. So now what's always important is in order to have a site like this and build buildings in healthcare, you need philanthropy. And this is a great story of a father and daughter in the community 
who lost a loved one to cancer that was treated at Bryan that felt moved to donate this site. And let's hear from them personally. Well, my mom first was diagnosed with cancer when I was a toddler, but I remember her telling me that she had cancer. And then she had a couple uh, different types of breast cancer throughout her life and ultimately lost her life to breast cancer. She enjoyed life, everything. Um, didn't matter if we were outdoors hunting, if it was a cold winter day inside, having a cup of coffee and just chatting. You know, we've been thinking about this project for nine or 10 years, and we've been working to put this all together. But what Brian does is reflect what the community needs, and the community has really stepped forward and said, we want this to happen. And nothing could be more evident than that than a gift of 30 acres uh, to Brian at this time. So here you kind of see an aerial of the site and uh, this tremendous feature there. So this is an early sketch uh, looking from the north as you approach the building. And you can see that we, this is a two story building and we've been able to use this big grade change to actually have both levels be at grade. So you'll enter at the upper floor, which is a grade, but even though you'll go down to radiation oncology, it is also a grade. So in a sense, the building is a split level with access to nature directly and visibly. So we'll show you more about that in a minute. So in cancer care, this is the program of the building, about 129,000 square foot building gross that you see in the upper right. And you can see that in the cancer center, typically the three biggest programs are what are bolded here, which are medical oncology for exam, your infusion center for chemotherapy, and your radiation oncology that will have delinear accelerators like Aaron just showed at New York Prez. But in addition here, in, in a freestanding cancer center, this was very comprehensive for one-stop shopping. So there is a multidisciplinary clinic. So you can, once diagnosed with cancer, can go in in one visit and you can see a medical oncologist, a radiation oncologist, and for example, a fellowship trained breast surgeon and they can collectively see you and come up with a treatment plan of what combination of surgery or therapies is right for you. And that's a very significant uh, satisfier for patients to be able to do that. I'll also talk in a minute about kind of a leading edge program they have around physical therapy that's included here in the Cancer Center. So some of the tools we use, I just think it's good for all the students to see some of the tools that we saw that you're already using and some of the crits we did this morning. Uh, this is a graphic program, and this happens to be medical oncology. And we did these for all the program areas, where in addition to an Excel spreadsheet or tabular program, you actually see every room in a given area graphically. You see it by type of space, like support or exam pods. We did have 30 exam rooms in the building. And Owners and clients and clinicians really understand sometimes this much more. These are actually all the scale of seeing them all at once versus just a written program. So this is just a tool that we used in the process. Um, we also do a lot with flow mapping, as Aaron said, and we continue to progress. So in our technology, like today in a virtual environment, we're doing this on a Miro board live uh, through a Zoom call like this. Um, but before the pandemic, uh, we did schematic design and here you see flow mapping was done live with these place cards to really curate that ideal future experience. And we had many people in the room taping them down, looking at various iterations of what should be that infusion flow or what should be that medical oncology flow and what are some of the primary flows or what are some of the secondary flows and what impact does that have to where programs are physically in the building. So we take diagrams like that and when we clean them up, so this one shows the result of one of the role plays and meetings, and we'll look from your pre-registration to arrival to all the way when you're checking out and departing the building. And you see the big circles in color are more the moments where you're stopping with more interaction or you're spending time in treatment. And we really think about what all of that means. So these become very powerful diagrams that lead to how we design space and thinking of that patient care and family experience. And this was very powerful because this was the diagram or the plans of the upper arrival level, lower level, to near the end of schematic design. And I'll particularly point to, you could see the arrival lobby and medical oncology was to the right of that and infusion was to the left. 
not uncommon. Uh, at Lancaster, you saw sometimes that the building and fusion will be on the second floor and medical college is on the first floor. And, but the more we got into the flow mapping and clinicians really understood, uh, they started to be concerned about the adjacency and coming back across the lobby. And so near the very end of schematic, I realized that and called leadership and said, you know, we're at this last responsible moment. We should consider a change in the floor plan, which is, you know, kind of a key moment in the project. And as a result of the flow mapping, on the next slide, you'll see that we flipped and we moved in, uh, medical oncology adjacent to infusion and radiation oncology also flipped. So it's just below and sometimes patients from radon come up to infusion to get hydration. And we didn't want patients to have to cross the lobby. And so uh, it was a very key moment of making a significant change in schematic design, but ultimately in mapping that would save the average infusion patient four to 500 feet in the total time of their journey. And of course, cancer patients suffer from fatigue, so uh, that's very important. So now with that set, I wanna start a video that I'm gonna narrate so there's no music or anything here. And we can go ahead and start that. So here is the arrival uh, and the site that you see overlaid with the cancer center and the parking. And the pond you see there uh, to the bottom. And you can see from the entry here that you will come in and medical oncology and infusion are right adjacent to the other with infusion having views out to the water. So you'll come into the arrival lobby with this glass that goes completely through the building. And you can see the, the use of the stone. You can see the wood for warmth looking right out to the pond. You see the concierge and greeter in the center. From there, wayfinding is very simple. So for medical oncology or infusion, you'll come through this portal. While folks are predominantly pre-registered, you could still sit and have some privacy for check-in. We hope to minimize waiting, but there is a nice waiting room uh, that looks out to nature. And then on one of our main components, we have 30 exam rooms, including some specialty exam rooms in medical oncology. And then right across is infusion. So there's this main spine with the skylights and these art alcoves. This is kind of an early video, so everything in color is not populated yet. But from medical oncology, you would come through one of these skylit art alcoves and through a portal. So you don't travel through every infusion bay. And we're passing the offstage corridor. And now you see the Vista design uh, looking out to the pond. And then you'll come to your infusion uh, neighborhood you can see decentralized stations between each of two infusion positions. So you could safely see the patient and how they're doing, but patients can look out the window. And so we'll pause here for a moment as you see a typical view from a fusion bay. Often patients are looking back in more of a bullpen sometimes, they're looking back so caregivers can see them. With the decentralized station, you could see the patient for safety, but patients and room for their families can enjoy nature. So predominantly, most of our view, uh, infusion are on the exterior wall looking out the window. But based on selection and talking and family uh, meetings, we do have some interior rooms. If the patient was there longer or did not want to be on the window wall, still private, but would be internal. Uh, to the bottom edge of the plan are a series of amenities, as well as our multidisciplinary clinic and our breast screening and diagnostic imaging. So uh, here's the multidisciplinary clinic with the two-sided exam room that Aaron spoke about uh, just a little bit ago. And then we have our breast screening and diagnostic imaging here with also an MRI. And then here you're seeing the chapel and meditation. So we can have services here as well as every day being a meditation out to nature. The appearance center has a series. You can get your hair cut, your nails done, uh, there's massage therapy, so a range of things there. Uh, this is the cafe and resource center. So you see the cafe with the brightest seating as sometimes families are here for a while waiting. And then you see a resource center that really has become digital these days. So really it's not so much about printed materials, although there are some, it's more about a space you can gather, you can have classes, a nurse navigator has a consultant room right off of that area. Then in the lower level, uh, the video is going really fast now. Um, <laughs> you see radiation oncology here right off of this lower level. So here we are one level down, but we're at grade. 
We use the split level building where you can walk directly out. And of course, uh, radiation oncology is usually at a lower level for the weight of the vaults has no light. And so here, this is your experience coming into radiation oncology uh, through the light filled lower atrium. And then you'll come in uh, to Radonc and it'll have its check in a waiting room, uh, which also uh, looks out to nature and out to the pond. And then you'll come from here and you'll come uh, into your linear accelerator, which went really fast. And then this is the unique physical therapy that they have both inside and exterior for this, all combined in this cancer center. They're really a leader in physical therapy with cancer. And we, we do work with the landscape architect. We actually have functional therapy healing gardens outside. So in good weather, you can go out. We have steps, we have bridges, different functional healing gardens for physical therapy. And as we come around uh, this part of the building, we also have a nice lawn. So in good weather, you can do yoga and various exercises uh, right in nature, right outside. Uh, we have a path that goes completely around the pond. So this is a view from the other side of the path on the pond. And again, you could see the warmth of the light limestone. Uh, you could see the use of glass, the kind of dramatic overhangs uh, in, in metal there that really create this kind of horizontal feel to tie in uh, with this landscape and be respectful. And here we're kind of uh, starting to swim right across the pond and you really get a sense of the views that you'll have from infusion and what patients, families, and caregivers, you could come out here on the break and just really enjoy uh, being outside. So uh, Brian Health, uh, this project, we're just finishing construction documents and construction will start this summer and open in about two and a half years. So just very quickly to close on this, this is that initial sketch that you saw. So this is your first view coming north to south when you arrive at the facility. And then you'll kind of come along the drive to this uh, welcoming entrance. Uh, you'll, you'll come right into the building at that through uh, lobby and atrium that leads you immediately right out to the pond and is a good wayfinding element. And as we come into the lobby, again, you see the use of the limestone and the wood coming in. And then we could step down the grand stair elevator down to the lower lobby. Again, to radiation ecology, we have a conference center there for tumor board as well as gatherings. This space was designed to be indoor-outdoor. They can have celebrations, they can have medical conferences. There's a lot of opportunity that this space provides in conjunction with the outdoor and the conference center. And then lastly, my favorite view is the rendering here that looks across the pond that you really get a sense to take in uh, the cancer center. So um, we've collaborated with just a wonderful client and a wonderful donor. Uh, that really meant a lot to him. So uh, we're very excited to see this project break ground later this year. So with that, I'll turn it over to Erin for some closing takeaways. Thank you, Lou. Yeah, we have some, some top five closing takeaways here that are common throughout all of the, all of the case studies that we showed today and really, really instrumental, especially for cancer care and heart care. Uh, so the first one is really our recognition of the value of foam mapping and the lens that that provides us in addition to programming. Uh, looking at ideal, uh, ideal arrangements, looking at the optimization of flows for patients, caregivers, and staff, and most importantly, layering in time, how much time uh, patients and staff spend in each location. And that's really informed our and enriched our understanding of the program and informed planning process a great bit. The second one is really understanding the co-location of program space and when certain areas of programs really want to be connected uh, or separated based on flows and circulation. Uh, our third takeaway is really looking at our own work and trying to continuously improve, uh, evolving our own templates. And through the three projects in the, can in the cancer care section, uh, we show them in that chronological order and really try to take uh, learning from prior projects and apply it to our next projects, as well as learning about uh, you know, the continual evolution of technology and innovation and care delivery, constantly learning and improving in our own work. 
Uh, the fourth is the importance of site and context considerations. And no cancer center, no, no healthcare center, no heart center is the same as another. Uh, they are all very unique and really trying to optimize the opportunities on a given site uh, to really make a wonderful, uh, a wonderful design and building. And finally, particularly with these two program types, are really being committed to embedding the use of art, use, and nature in the design, even if it's difficult. I think in all four of the projects that we showed, uh, some were naturally lended themselves to, uh, to views and nature and circulation, and others it may have been a little more challenging, uh, but particularly for, for patients who are, you know, suffer from chronic conditions like heart care and cancer, they may be coming to these facilities over many years of their lives uh, for a continuum of care. And so really committing to embedding those in the, in the design is key. So with that, we are happy to take any questions and, and provide answers to them. Thank you. What a wonderful presentation. You should look at the chats and uh... Uh, I, I just want to recognize Ray Pentecost has joined us. He's the director of the Center for Health Systems and Design. And Ron Skaggs has also joined us. He's one of the donors to make uh, this lecture series possible along with Joe Spray. So having said that, let's open it up for questions from the audience. If you wouldn't mind putting on your cameras so we can see your lovely and handsome faces. Uh, that would be nice. Any questions? Hi, I have a question about the pro the project in New York. Uh, yeah, I was so so impressed to see you have the linear accelerator on the fourth floor. So I wonder if there's any uh, restriction in that project to to have those uh, linear accelerator on on ba on the basement or ground floor, because my, uh, my internet is not very stable today, so I may lose some important information. All right. Well, thank you. I, I think I, I heard the, the question, uh, which is about uh, what what the considerations were to put the linear accelerators on the fourth floor at yeah. New York Presbyterian's yeah. Coke Center. Um, it's really a wonderful example of how we collaborated as an entire project team to come to that decision and a number of factors came into that. Um, as you can imagine, there is cost associated with elevating though that equipment uh, up in the building. We might more typically see them at grade or below grade. Uh, but in New York in particular, uh, below grade space is very expensive to excavate. Uh, so there's a little bit of, of consideration there. Um, parking is very challenging and we do have parking below grade. Um, but what's really fascinating about this is that the proximity of that project to the East River, um, it is close to the floodplain. And while we were in design for the project, uh, Superstorm Sandy hit New York and there was some very significant flooding uh, throughout many hospitals in the city. And so we really looked at a cost benefit analysis and what it what it would mean to elevate that equipment um, high. It actually protected them from severe adverse weather events as well. Um, so it really was a, a wonderful collaboration with our structural engineer, uh, our client, and really involved our, uh, our kind of site analysis and, and cost analysis. Great question. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, there was a question in the chat, George, that says uh, we talked a little bit in our flow mapping about kiosk check-in, but they saw a number of still traditional check-in stations. So thank you for your question. I think you'll see at New York Pres, we literally went all to kiosk check-in, although there were ambassadors that if you were not comfortable, they could just check you in centrally in the lobby. In a number of our other cancer centers, what you'll see is still like based on the community in Lincoln, we do have some kiosk, but they still wanted that personal touch and felt that they wanted to have for the foreseeable future, uh, that personal touch upon check-in, even though there are some kiosks. So I think every community is a little different in, in the way they want to approach that, but it's a great question. We are seeing more and more of trying to go to the kiosk check-in, as probably many of you are saying. Thank you. One, one of the things I'd like to share with you is my reaction 
don't you, I've exchanged some uh, texts. Don't you feel the passion and the enthusiasm about what they do? And it's contagious. And uh, I urge you, whatever you do, that you show passion because that's a universal language. Some of us may not know everything all the time and uh, we can always find that out, but you can tell pretty quickly if someone's passionate and you need that passion to get through the rough spots. You gotta keep going, keep going forward. So uh, uh, this was a fantastic presentation and I should keep my mouth shut and let someone else talk. Hello, this is Charlotte Sims. It's a beautiful project and I had one, uh, one question to ask about the dematinal panels you used in the, I believe it was the procedure OR room. Could you explain why y'all decided to use the dematinal wall panels? Sure, sure. Yeah, so those are modular wall panels in all of the operating rooms. Uh, that, that project was conducive to that because we had templated operating rooms. And one of the decision-making factors there was long-term operations and the ability to be able to remove a wall panel, modify it and put it back up over time. So that as technology changes over the course of, of many years of operation, the, the operating rooms and interventional rooms could be more easily adapted. Thank you. You're welcome. Ray, are you? Uh, Any questions? Is Ray still on? Uh, I was going to ask him that. My screen split suddenly. I'm here, George. Uh, Ray's waving his hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ray, do you have any thoughts on uh, on the presentation or the subject matter? The uh, the question that that uh, I was trying to think through, so I didn't ask it inappropriately. The project that uh, one of your earlier projects that had the big sort of U-shaped curve uh, around the central area and the circulation along the inside wall and then things moved uh, away from that zone. Uh, it looked like that was not a fixed radius. And I was mm -hmm. just curious how you came up with that unusual curve and what were the constraints that drove you to a radius and how did you how did you communicate that to the builder so that you got that unusual radius that you actually wanted so ray um the outside and inside are quite different so uh what what we had is that radius used to be a retaining wall where there was a parking lot on top of so we had an existing site condition that was rather unique. In fact, you couldn't even see when you came to Radoff, when you drove up, you ran into a brick wall and there was parking on top of it. So we sited the building and then expanded Radon. We, which good that you didn't notice, radiation oncology was existing, but the goal was we built the new building that you would never know that it wasn't there to start with. And then we expanded it. So it sounds like it might've worked. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so we took that curve that was a little unusual and basically had to springboard off of that. Now the outside curve kind of takes the one we wanted, but Dr. Oyer is also the chair of cancer, a great champion for architecture. When he goes to cancer conferences, I think he sees more museums as he would say as much as he's in the conferences. And he really wanted along with the donor, Ms. Barsinger, an iconic building. And so it kind of all played in that that site condition maybe helped us, Ray. Maybe it would have been harder just to do it, to do it. But you know, each site, as Aaron said, gives an opportunity and building on that springboard also helped us to phase the project because we couldn't take away exactly the front door before we built the new front door. So there were, there were some interesting site conditions that again, you leverage to make an advantage. Like at Brian Health, we took a 50 foot grade change, which could be a downer and made that to advantage. So each site, as you know, is quite unique. Well, your work continues to impress. Every time you bring projects, they're just really, really beautiful. And the thought behind them is uh, striking. So well done again. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for having us. Thank you, Ray. Uh, and Ron, anything you want to add? 
Yeah, as I, I don't know if others are cutting out, but um, I think there's some weather issues or something in Texas, probably not in Pennsylvania. Uh, Lou, how are you doing? It's nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Can you Ron hear me? To play some jazz? Yeah. Still playing jazz. I can hear you. Uh, the <laughs> pandemic's made it harder, but I'm still doing that. Uh, um, but it's nice to see you, and Aaron, it's nice to meet you. Uh, Y'all both did a wonderful job of presenting highly complex parts of healthcare uh, done in a beautiful way, and you're to be congratulated. And I hope to see y'all face to face in the future. No question, Thank just you. compliments. <laughs> <laughs> I proposed a, uh, I, should, I should give you a heads up, but I got so excited. You know, there's a health program at Temple that I helped start a couple of years ago. And uh, maybe we could do a four-way, uh, two firms and two universities, uh, A&M and Temple and uh, HKS and, and Ballinger on a project. Uh, we did that before in, with, University of Oklahoma, um, Miles Associates in Oklahoma, HKS and Texas A&M, and IPPR and uh, Southeast University where Zippon went. And, and Mia Kyle, who's on the uh, yeah, so you know she was a big part of that from University of Oklahoma at that time. So so uh, that that could be a lot of fun for the students and all of us. Uh, yeah. Just well, idea. maybe we could collaborate on, I'm now retired, but maybe the two firms could collaborate on something and then we'd have a real good reason. <laughs> there <you> go. <laughs> Just as I did with uh, Pay Cobb Freed, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Also, uh, George, we, I noticed that a lot of folks from Andy, MD Anderson, so uh, Liz Sumet and Bakov and uh, others, and then, you know, that's the great turnout, Lou and Aaron. Thank you so yeah, much. You had 78 people. I, I thought that was the high number. Of course, people had to leave. It was a wonderful presentation. And I think we're so fortunate to have Zoom. I'd have to find out who invented this because, uh, <laughs> you know, you get so much done that we couldn't do before. It's always nicer in person. So uh, students have any other comments or some are not, we're all students, first of all, even me. Uh, I learn more from the students than they'll ever learn from me. Uh, <laughs> so, and there are a lot of friendships that happen too, uh, related to the work. Um, it is now uh, 2.05 their time and either, they, they probably gonna face uh, 150 emails each. Uh, after this and uh, it was a wonderful day to have you. Before we give them a round of applause, I'd like to ask Madison to flash up the um, announcement for next week's talk. And of course, anybody in Ballinger or we have uh, Josiane Tanchu in Paris, France at the moment uh, is welcome to join. You can simply click on that blue box and uh, the firm that we have next week is Page. And I believe Page was founded in 1898 and is the longest lasting architectural firm in Texas. And those of you who are close to architectural firms, it is very hard to maintain continuity because people wanna maintain control and then suddenly they die I hope everybody dies. I hope I'm not bringing you news from the front. And uh, so the idea is to stick around as long as you can. So Robert Doan is a graduate of Texas A&M and they were used to be called Page Southern and Page and they went into branding and simplified their name, which might be a good idea, but that's their business. And they're gonna be talking about wellness to illness, a uh, new look at one health systems approach the continuum of care and that's uh cones health drawbridge project in greensboro north carolina so we're always learning something new frankly um there isn't a day that that goes by that i just the, the industry is so vast that i 
I, I'm not familiar with Cone's Health until I got their title. And George, I, I have one quick announcement. Yes. And uh, the PDC, PDC stands for uh, Planning, Design, and Construction for Healthcare uh, Facilities. And uh, uh, ASHI organized that American Society of Health Engineering. And they recruited uh, our school for the uh, student design direct is in May, uh, it's during the Memorial weekend. I'm gonna send out a message to Shay and uh, to recruit four students. And I saw Danielle still here. Danielle was the one of the student participants in the, in the past. That's a national uh, exposure to the, uh, uh, to the, you know, uh, the professionals uh, in uh, healthcare design and construction. So that would be good opportunity for students. I'm, I'm gonna send out that invitation to you. Uh, yeah. I plan to recruit four students uh, uh, from uh, Texas a and yeah, Zipan, could you send me a copy so I could send it to the fourth year? Uh, do you entertain some good fourth year students? Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, and then I also want to give a prize to Danielle. She has uh, taken Woody Allen's advice. She shows <laughs> up, 95% of success is showing up, but she's she, she, she's good without showing up, but she shows up. And the prize, the longest standing prize goes to Mr. Skaggs. He's, he graduated, but he never left, thank God. And he's been part of our program. And so we're, we always look forward to seeing new friends and old friends. So uh, Jay, anything you wanna add? All right, let's give a real round of applause and, and reactions on our screen. Uh, here's my applause. And uh, it was terrific and very inspiring. I love, I love to get reinvigorated from these contacts. And I don't know if I'm going to Philly, but if I do, you know, last summer, it was the last, first time in 13 years I didn't go. So it depends on, uh, you know what, uh, the COVID, uh, company that we keep. So I, I'd love to go see my grandkids. So <laughs> thank you all for coming. And Ron, thank you for your continued interest and support. And Ray, you got a lot of other things to do. And Zipong, and I love you all. Adios.